What's up, guys? Welcome to KaneCast. Like, share, subscribe, all the things right here. I'm your host, Josh Kane, and joined with me is my co-host, Oriah right, Christine. <laughs> Dylan Bennett. <laughs> and today we have a special guest, Ryan Renfield. Talk a little bit about music. We're going to go around the room and just ask a bunch of random questions. So let's start. Ryan, what was your start in music? How did you get into it? What was it? Take us to the beginning. Um, uh, probably, uh, well, I grew up in the church, you know. Same? Yeah. So, uh, and dad was into country and mom was into like, you know, kind of more contemporary, like kind of pop and stuff like that. So, and then a lot of gospel music. So I, I actually started writing songs when I was probably 10 or 11 years old and playing them for the church and stuff like that on Sunday. Wow. Yeah. That's aw- dude. That's awesome. Yeah, what? That okay. Yeah. <laughs> we got a bunch of church people in here. Do we all wait? Did we all have some kind of experience growing up with like gospel music or something? Mm-hmm. Not, just oh, n- no. It's Ryan, just me and I didn't. It's just me <laughs> and every. <laughs> I was a I was a missionary. Yeah. yeah. If I for step a few into years. a church, I'm gonna burst into flames. So. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> that's incredible. So like yeah. the gospel music, like so kind of bluesy stuff or more. Yeah, I mean anything from like old school church hymns to like you know like what you would. Consider to be like modern Christian, um, like pop, I guess. Yeah, like you the know? contemporary kind of like yeah. um, Mercy Me almost, or no? Um, like, or a little bit before that? Like maybe. I'm not familiar. So I was like, back in the day, I think uh, Petra was one of my okay. bands that I used to listen to and stuff. I didn't write songs like that, but that was like kind of what I would listen to because I wasn't really allowed to listen to secular yeah, they're like, music. So, like, like, so was the instrument for you, was it guitar? Guitar. Oh, I, am, I think I wrote my first two or three songs on a tennis racket. <laughs> uh, what? I actually wrote a song. You can ask my brothers this too. When I was like six years old, I wrote a song called "A Crack in the Darkness." <laughs> it's pretty funny. And I would just like, I just grab yeah, like yeah. whatever I could to like mimic playing guitar or whatever. And I and I, I had a chorus for it, and that was it. And I never actually wrote. Okay, but you, I would just sing that over and over. I think you need to read. Yeah, you should bring it back. You, you should bring it back. <laughs> revisit it. Like I think that this because someone did like what the shovel, the gent shovel online. You should do oh, like yeah. a tennis racket. Oh, the shovel guitar is fucking rad. Dude, yeah. you could totally do the tennis. I racket. want. I want a fucking shovel guitar, man. <laughs> you would that bring it out on I like stage. those uh, cigar yeah. box ones. Yeah, those are cool. Those, too, are, those are way cool. Those are pretty cool. I just uh, you know what my most reach, uh, recent acquire. Uh, thing I acquired was an arch top guitar. Like I've never had one of those and they're super weird. It has a wooden saddle. It's oh. a, like a semi hollow. It's beautiful. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll oh man, I love that. Uh, Resonator is one of the guitars I need to get, man. So, yeah. Because I, you know, do a little slide, a little finger plucking. Yeah. You know? Dude, you got some crazy st- You've been doing like a lot of like the hammer claw stuff. Like I've yeah. seen it because you had that Martin, uh, which Martin were you? It's a Martin like? DRS2. So it's kind of like, it's not like the bottom, bottom shelf one, but it's kind of like up from the bottom, like maybe one level. But it's still, a, it's no, still it's, a rag it's, guitar. It's, it's, oh, yeah. No, yeah. I have a Sigma, Martin Sigma. And I love that oh, thing, nice. and it, it plays. I mean, if I am playing unplugged, that versus like say my Ibanez, like plugged in, you can't tell too much, right? Because you can do a lot and exactly. Close, but unplugged, that thing beats out all my acoustics just by itself. It just sounds oh, wow. so good. It's it's ridiculous. Man. So you play like okay, guitar, guitar. So you you've gone from like doing a lot of like metal stuff and acoustic stuff, like kind of. So was acoustic the start, like, or was it? I think, oh, well, so when I first started learning, I learned on a 12-string my, that my stepdad had brought home when my mom brought him home. So I started learning, you know, all the basic chords and, you know, all the major stuff. And, you know, I got really good really fast, and then I got complacent just like I did, you know, later on, on in life with, with other things. But um, um, it, it started there, and then actually when I was 17 or so, um, I wanted to learn more. And that's when I actually met Tony when I was, like, 16. And I met him at this party, and it was it was the craziest thing. Because here's this dude, you know, like five years older than me. He's, he's 21. I'm 16. I'm at this party with like all these like adults, and um, he's wasted. I mean, he's totally drunk. He's wearing a white. <laughs> he was wearing a white leather jacket, with no shirt. You know, oh like, yeah. This was like 1988. Yes. Okay. And I was like trying to put together a band. I'm all cocky, you know, because I know some power chords and shit. Yeah. And he's like talking a big game. He's like, dude, ah. Oh, 
shred, man. I'm, and he's like, he's just talking huge. Because he used to, I, as humble as he was before he passed, when he was young, holy I learned how to be cocky from Tony. Like, he gave me cocky lessons 101. So, awesome. so when I met him, he's like, dude, see this finger? And he literally, like, pulls out his finger and he flexes it. And he goes, feel that. When he flexes it. He's got abs on his finger. His finger. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, like, super push up with your finger. <laughs> oh, my God. That's amazing. Okay. So, you know, and I was like, so can you play, man? And he's like, Phew. and he's like, who's this kid, man? I'm like, what the f***? And I was a cocky little shit. And he's like, hey, tell you what, man, I'm moving tomorrow. Come help me. And he didn't, Tony never had a license. Like, he drove, but he never had a license. So Rock I was 16, and I just got my license. I, and I'm, I have an opportunity to, like, hang out with this band because he's in a big band at, at the time, you know, Gypsy Rose and shit. And so the next day, I went over to help him move, and he, uh, he, put, he busted out a, an acoustic guitar and started shredding on some Yngwie stuff. And I had just discovered Yngwie, and I was like, Oh fuck! Somebody can actually play this shit. Are yeah. you kidding me like right you, now? Yeah. You know so I was like, dude. Okay, cool, man. And then we were buddies from then on. That's I amazing. Used to, I used to like shuttle those guys around, man. All these, you know, and they totally accepted me and like brought me into their little circle, man. And like these are all like twenty-something people, you know, like in their twenties, and like a lot of big bands, like Mike Starr used to come over and hang out at the Hobbit House, and oh my you know, all the God. Jerry Cantrell guys. All those guys used to come over and hang out, and they, they were actually. Um, buddies with Tony, you know, a lot of these guys. So, for know. those of you that don't know who we're talking about, we're talking about Tony Delisio. Yeah, Tony yep, Delisio. Tony Delisio. Yeah, my good buddy. He was a mentor to me. You know, I, the only two guitar lessons I ever had, I took from Tony. That's amazing. Yeah, and I'm, he was basically, I was just doing it to really support him because he'd already showed me pretty much everything he could show me, you know, yeah. like just hanging out, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, I'll, I'll give you some money and we'll just make it formal. You yeah, know? make it formal. <laughs> like, this. how do you play G major? Right. Like, exactly. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. So, oh, yeah, and he's, he, he had a really good uh, method, you know, like and he, he liked to call it the connect the dots method. And that's where you just learn all the modes, yep. you know. And basically, if you know all the modes and you know how to move them up and down, you're good. Yeah. Man, you know, I mean, that's cool. I mean, I guess to bring up modes too, one thing that I do as a, like, as a music instructor too is I always try to teach, because you know the, the weird names you have right. um, Dorian Viridian, Lydian, Mixolydian, Alien, and Little Korean, and that's a lot, a mouthful um, for sure. the students to learn. So I always say, I don't paint like Michelangelo, and that seems like Ionian, you know, that kind of gets those through there. Like, oh, there you go. Yeah, Ionian does. Well, just like every good boy does fine. Yeah, every good boy does fine, except let's do this in Italian or whatever they do. Right. I love how in music, I, in music they make I things. G A F. I do. I don't give a <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. That's 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 crazy. I think I memorized the strings by. Uh, I think it was like, oh, I think it had something to do with biting dinosaurs or something. Oh, that one acronym uh, for the string. There's Eddie Eight Dynamite. Goodbye, Eddie. It's a great one. Of this elephants, every oh elephants and dinosaurs go by every. <laughs> or my fa or my favorite one to teach, and this I don't teach kids. You know, this is what I teach my adult students: is every acid dealer gets busted eventually. <laughs> <laughs> so not only learning yeah, how I, really I just, I, yeah, just yeah. I just know like north, south, east, and west. You know, yeah, yeah. never eat soggy waffles. <laughs> <laughs> is there wait, is there an end note in music like? Uh, no, but I'm just north, south, oh, east, oh, west. Oh, gotcha. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> north, east, south. He's like, we're going to use microtonal notes. Yes. So don't exist. No, that's just drummer talk you wouldn't understand. Uh, yeah, you're right. No, you're right. I only know four and four, man. What's yeah. what's all the other stuff? I just know. And k oh, yeah. <laughs> boots and cats. cats. Boots and cats. Boots and cats. Yeah. Puss and boots. Teaching that. kids, that's the best. They're like, oh, boots and cats? You know, I they love, love that. that. Oh, boots that's an easy one. Boots and cats. And so, the, what, okay, what was your first guitar then? So, oh. I mean, or actually, better yet, because um, you played like it's an acoustic one. Right. What was your first electric guitar? That's a good question. And uh, you know what? I fucking miss this guitar. I wish I had it right now. And it was um, a Segovia a that Segovia. I got at Sears Roebuck. And, uh, dude, it was the coolest star body kind of design. And... Dude, I could plug it into David Ellenwood's um, stereo at home, and distor there was distortion, man. So I was like instantly in love with this guitar yeah. too, man. And uh, um, yeah, I wish I could find that guitar now because it would probably be worth money. Oh, for sure. That. I mean, having so that's amazing. So Segovia, what color was it? It was like a like a dark starburst, like a black and cherry starburst kind of nice. thing. Nice. It was that, really cool, man. That's awesome. Well, really quick, guys. We're going to take a quick commercial break. And, um, yeah. Are you tired of your drummer's stick slipping? <laughs> Are you sick of every show the drumstick flies in the audience and hits someone in the face? <laughs> Introducing Drum Goo. Drum Goo. Drum Goo. 
Apply generously. Lather and grip. Now you're ready to rock. Ever since my drummer's gotten drum good, his grip has been impeccable. Yeah! Ingredients include sulfates, parabens, and your mother's toe jam. Extra sticky. This'll do the trick. Just give your drummer some grip. Oh no, I think I'm stuck. Here, let me help you. <laughs> On the chance that this stuff might cement and harden, and you're hard for more than four hours, call a doctor. A dab of goo will do. Is keeping your drummer in time tricky? Get some drum goo. Keep them sticky. Now on sale for $420.69. No drummers were harmed in the making of this. Back to Kanecast. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, all the things. Um, let's let's get back to it. All right, I think you had a point that you wanted to go over. Oh, I right? did? Yeah, I think so. Oh. Maybe not. Oh, no. Uh, oh, yeah, this is my dad. Yeah. Hi, everybody. <laughs> we're going to name this uh, episode like uh, father, like daughter. Like the, There we go. Bam. We got episode Both slogan. Thinking. It's amazing. Both incredibly talented musicians, Aww. so the apple does not fall far from the tree. It's actually Golly, pretty thanks, crazy. Man. Well, And some of you guys might not know this, just to kind of quick uh, bring this up. is He was in Mechanism as well as Renfield Syndrome. Incredible guitar player. Does this crazy... Hammer claw stuff too, like so he's not just doing like electric stuff, like some chicken we, picking. Why don't we go over that really quick? The chicken picking thing. Tell us how that kind of happened, and then sure. bring your point back to. I know you have something you wanted to go over, right? Oh, I don't so know. Like, okay, okay, whatever. whatever. I right. So, remember. like I told you, I learned, yeah. l learned on acoustic. Then I, you know, then I got into metal and stuff, which I was always into, and I was always into a lot of different styles of music. But um, um. So after Araya was born, like uh, in the early '90s, you know, I, I really wanted to, to like diversify for lack of a better term you know yeah. i wanted to like you know explore and learn some other stuff and i got a, a dave uh, matthews cd man <laughs> okay and, man you know that that really started me down the rabbit hole and i learned um uh too much or whatever that song is and um right right from that moment on man i like we just moved to reno and um i probably spent the next year just like getting this style down and of course i have a friend named michael lee ferkins who's like a he's a savant guitar player and he does this he showed me like how to pick just using, you know, these two fingers, mostly, you know, alternate picking yeah. with just these two, you know, just yeah. kind of replace the pick. And then, you know, you start adding this one in and then you start adding this one in. Yeah, pretty and then, soon. And then you start learning Travis picking and then yeah. it just goes down the whole, you know, the whole rabbit hole, you know. So, um, so yeah, probably around, you know, the mid 90s is when I really started to, you know, delve into finger picking, you know, like that was uncommon, but, you know, like. Yeah, not really like uh, what you would hear in, in even music at the time. You know what I mean? That's amazing. Yeah, yeah I mean, and it's that finger style is such a. I think it's becoming more appreciated now. I think yeah. that there was a, a time where everyone was really into like just the crazy, you know, alternate pick shredding stuff. Oh, sure. I love that too. But it's really impressive, like these flamenco and these classical guitar players. Oh, like sure. they, What they're doing is incredible. Being able to have that separation in each finger. Dude, Matteo you know? Mancuso. Oh, he's a, mm -hmm. yeah. This weird thing, they, savage. And he's like, yeah, and it's it's like this, and it's the most it's so awkward, unorthodox. Uh, yeah. And it, dude, so and flawless. He, yeah, I was watching a video because he was on Rick Beato, um, and he played. He did the same phrase with a pick versus fingers it sounded way better with his fingers yeah. and it's like it, he isn't filed like his fingers are so well groomed like it, it's insane yeah so it's, it, it's crazy man it's, it's like amazing. dude I can't even man you know I, I can get these three moving pretty good together you know as far as like just play, playing linear notes you know like yeah. you know I, and I do it just better with these two yeah. you know like, I can just do that all day but when you start adding like other fingers into that kind of linear playing, like when you're man, it's it's, a, just, it's, it's it, amazing. Man, it is really crazy. It's so unorthodox, man. It, yeah. it, it, it when I imagine the transition too, like for for me thinking about that, I'm like, you want those nails a little longer? They can act as picks and they can slide over the strings. Exactly. Where your skin's gonna grip Some on. Some of it. those guys' fingernails are thick. Dude, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I have like these claws, man, that I have to grow out just for this. Yeah. So like when I play electric and I'm just playing metal or whatever like that, 
this can sometimes be a problem with like holding the pick. Yeah, unless you want yeah. a hybrid pick. Well, <laughs> I, can do, I can do a little bit of that, but then you got guys like Tim Hansen, man, that are like, insane. oh fuck, absolutely. Yeah, and that's another freak of nature right there, yeah. too, man. That guy is insane. We're getting a, we're getting a lot of these freak of natures out there. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's crazy, man. It's exponential. It seems like because when I was a kid, man, like just being able to play like. You know, learning how, learning how to do an arpeggio sweep was like, oh shit, dude, you can arpeggio sweep. You know, now it's like, that's like it's a standard. 101. You it's know? a standard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some of the drummers that I watch nowadays just, you know, I mean, you just look back in the day and like see, see like people starting with some double bass, you know, like maybe even like Ginger Baker or something like that oh, from Cream, you know. And now you look at like a dude and he's playing like 64th notes, you know, like 300 BPMs, you know, just, yeah. you know, it's like, it, it's like, it turns kind of machine after a while. What are they putting in the fast food? Like what is going on? <laughs> Us, man, it's, it's, evolution. Like, it's evolution. Yeah. yeah that new it is Slipknot evolution. drummer, man, is fucking insane. Dude. Well, uh, Eloy? Yeah, Eloy. Yeah, he's, he's the drummer, or Sub- he was the drummer right? of He's Sepultura. the new one announced? Yeah, he's been the drummer of Sepultura okay. for a long, long time. Right. Uh, okay, I mean, I, dude, I remember watching videos of him when I was young, just going, what the yeah. hell is this? He never really you know? showcased his talent though until like he started making videos on YouTube because yeah. I've seen him. I've seen him live. You know, I mean, yeah. Araya used to he sing is "Roots, probably, Buddy Roots" in the yeah, backseat. Oh, you yeah. know? <laughs> He's probably the hardest hitting drummer with the most technique and speed. I've yeah. never seen a guy hit as hard as he does. And go as fast as he does, dude. It's, it's incredible, it's unfucking real. Yeah. I mean, how long can you? I mean, he probably breaks how three long snare can you drums do that, show. Like, <laughs> yeah, and not and not like just fall apart, man. It's, yeah. it, it just takes so he much. He is pretty jacked. They're focus. just injecting caffeine into their legs. <laughs> They're just Red like, Bull. here you go, Red Bull. <laughs> yeah, between songs, just. <laughs> Yeah, he's yeah, like, he's wow. insane. I mean, when you got a guy like uh, L.S. Depario Siberiano, oh, yeah. oh my insane. God. Like, when that guy is like watch watching videos of um, what's his face and going, this guy's insane. I'm like, dude, really? That's like, like the highest compliment it ever is, coming because that him. guy is like probably my favorite drummer. Yeah, like, well, no, he's, 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 he's ridiculous. Nature. Like with one hand. Too. Yeah, one hand. Yeah. yeah, smoking a joint, fucking drinking a beer, and yeah. playing yeah. Slipknot yeah. the entire. Yeah, and he's just yeah. relaxed and like, he's doing something else. Have you seen the videos of him doing like all those polyrhythms? Oh yeah, oh, no, yeah. I've probably seen every video he's put out, man. Yeah. I mean, he's I watched him. He's real good. He actually yeah. just had released his band. Finally, had a has a band, and they released their first single. Actually. I just saw it the other day, and it's really and it's not what you would expect, you know? Yeah. I mean, it was know. just kind of cool, groovy. Like it wasn't really like. Well, that just showcases his talent. Well, because it it does. It takes the spotlight off like what could be a shredding guitar player. Yeah, and it know, makes or whatever. Yeah. Like, where's that guy in the background? Where's that guy lost in the mix? <laughs> one, what I love too is is when you know it, with a monster player like that, if you can make like. I mean, we've talked about this before too. I mean, for me, I think like if the song is great and everyone like has their place, like that. To me is like the best, but because right. sometimes like if you have more commonly this is with guitar players, sure. But they'll just like over the top guitar solos for like ten minutes. And yeah, it's nice to have like if the song is great. Yeah, there's a niche for that. Yeah, yeah there's, there's, no, a there time, is. there's a time and there, a place exactly. for that. Exactly. But if you're playing a song that you want to like say maybe sell, you know, or yeah, market, exactly. Then I mean, you have to like implement a little bit of you know, a little juice. Yeah, a little little something <laughs> that attracts sauce. people to it. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, do you want to talk about some of the different bands that you've been in over the years? Sure. Yeah. Well, where you was your? About? Who was your first band? Yeah. Oh, first band. Well, I mean, uh, so the very first band I had, um, that would go back to all the way. Oh, well, let's see. I was seventeen, and um, I had just met Tony, right? And in hanging out with him, I had met Andrew, which wound up being my first bass player in, in like the beginnings of my very first band. And their their band name, and this is hilarious too. When I joined. Uh, it was Simplex 2. <laughs> Simplex 2. Simplex 2, like Herbie Simplex 2. Oh, <laughs> my God. Yeah. I was like, that took a minute. I was like, so it was me me and um, Andrew Denniston and um, Dale Puckett. And then later on, who was uh, the, another, the guitar player that came along later was um, Rick Bonifant. But he was actually, he had jammed with them before and then left. And then they replaced him with me. And then he came back and joined the band after that, too. So, And then that eventually became... Um, Original Sin, and um, one other name that I forget. And uh, we did a bunch of recording, and we played we played some shows and stuff, and we won like a battle of the bands and shit like. And wow. we were like seventeen, and we were shredding, you know. Like people were like, "Oh shit," you know. Kind of like you, when you guys were all kids, you know, and on, on Halo. That's why you guys reminded me of us when we were kids. Yeah. You know? But um, so um, gosh, where were we? 
Banshee. Talking about Banshee Bin, yeah. yeah. Banshee oh, yeah. Bin. So, so oh yeah, and that uh, and then eventually that became Naked Zoo with Jim uh, Cooper. And Jim Cooper used to play in Diamond Lie with um, um, Jerry Cantrell, which was basically Alice in Chains before right before that they before that they formed. changed to Alice in Chains. So they were called Diamond Lie, and so Jimmy was in my band, and um, that became Mojo Hand. And then uh, Araya was born, and then we moved to Sacramento, and then that's where I started Delta Nine. Long story short, because I had met, actually in Sacramento, I had met Jimmy O'Shea, and him and I tried to put together a band for about a year. Yeah. Uh, and Jimmy, Jimmy O'Shea, O'Shea was the bass player for Cacophony. Okay, yeah. yeah. Oh my god! And like, I met a lot of people through him. Like, he took me to Mike Varney's house, like the guy that discovered Ingve, and you know, I, I sat there and talked to Mike Varney, like, like we're talking right now while he was listening to fucking demo tapes, and um, it was in Vallejo, and I remember his house, four million dollar mansion, no air. We're f-ing up there sweating like slaves, man. He's listening to demos, telling me all these stories, and Jimmy was like off in the other room, like making copies of something or something like that, and I was just. Sitting there talking to Mike Varney for like an hour, man. I, okay. <laughs> so no ventilation, but we're talking to Mike, so this is cool. Yeah, no, it was cool. And, uh, uh, well, I guess I, I should omit some things from that experience because I don't want to, like, you know, be a dick or anything. But yeah, yeah, it yeah, was, it was totally a pretty fair. cool experience, though. Yeah. So I met him and I met, um, like I said, Michael Lee Ferkins, who, man, uh, if you've never listened to this guy play guitar, he has the coolest thing where, like, he does the Jeff Beck thing where he uses his wah as kind of, or not his wah, but his whammy as um, kind of like a slide simulation. That's cool. So okay. I mean, dude, his, dude, he's a freak of nature. He's, he played on the first Jason Becker album um, that Jason wasn't able to actually play. Yeah, after, oh, wow. and after it started yeah. kicking his MS. Yeah, and he was in a band called over. The Howling Iguanas and uh, with Little John Chrisley. And Little John Chrisley was like this freak of nature harp player from, and he was on That's Incredible when I was a little kid, like nine years old. This kid's up there just, uh, just <laughs> waiting on the harp, man. And so he was in a band with him, and Jimmy was in that band as well, and that's kind of how I met all those guys was through Jimmy. So That's incredible. Uh, that's a, yeah, that's great. Okay, so then after Delta 9, yeah. and... So, yeah, so Delta 9 um, was in Reno, and we, you know, uh, Nick Somerville was the singer, and um, uh, Denny Evans was the drummer. And we did some good stuff, but there wasn't really much of a scene, you know? In, in Reno. There wasn't really, yeah, there wasn't much of a scene, so we didn't really have much success, but we recorded some cool stuff, and um, eventually that dissolved, and then um, Tiffany and I got a divorce, and I wound up, like, traveling the whole West Coast, and, you know, a strip club DJ, so, you know, I just kind of went wherever the money was, and, and, uh, and I always recorded, it, but I didn't, there was a gap in, you know, from, like, 2000 to, like, 2007, where I only played in one band, and that was uh, Defame. Defame? Yeah, I was in a band called Defame, and uh, we only wound up playing, like, probably over the course of a summer, probably, like, three or four shows. But it was really good. I mean, really talented guys. Uh, Mike Graham was the singer, and a guy named Steve Thomas was the drummer. And he was, like, an MIT grad, and, I mean... Yeah, okay. We were really good, man, but I got a job offer to go back down uh, to Reno and work, so I, you know, flew the coop and left that band and uh, wound up back down in Reno, and then back up here probably three or four different moves and then uh tony and i wound up in the same town in puyallup and i i just randomly one day on myspace when myspace was a thing and oh was, my gosh hey tony dude it's been forever man where are you at he's like dude i'm in puyallup lol i was like where in puyallup he goes south hill i go really because dude we wound up being like two miles from each other are you serious? Oh, wow. yeah. after all these years yeah and uh he's like dude man come over let's hang out man let's fucking hang out so we, of course we you know gonna hang out and then uh he's i played him some of the stuff i'd been been recording like succubus and shameless and stuff like that and he's like dude this is rad man i have this music man why don't you like put some lyrics on it and see what happens so he gave me the music to psycho and uh um i just i just had some drinks took it home and had some drinks and like just wrote psycho over the top of it man and that like wound up being one of my most you know popular songs so and it was the first that we really collaborated on and that's He's like, dude, let's start a band. And we still argued, you know, over who asked who. Who asked who? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> who asked who? <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I still say it was him. So, yeah. so this is how this is how you guys started it. Like mechanism was started that. that that's, that's how we started mechanism. Yeah. That's that's amazing. And then you guys gathered. Uh, I think it was. Is it Mark? One of the guys, or who's, who's so there was a lot of members. Um, the ori- the yeah. original guys were um, uh, Rob Roderman and Mike Parker. Okay. Because a, a few months before that, 
in between trips to Reno and back, um, I was jamming with those guys, and we were putting together some cool stuff, man. And you know, I left and came back, and uh, when Tony was like, "Hey, man, let's, you got any guys?" You know, I was like, "Yeah, I got some. I got some guys I was jamming with a few months back, man. Let me call them." So, and that was that was it, man. I mean, we got together at Rob Harvey's house, who was always love Rob. Amazing. Shout out to Rob. Yeah, we shout love out you, to my buddy Rob. Dude, Rob's incredible. Yeah, he's he's really assisted and helped us out with like he, whenever he sees something with potential, he just wants to be. A part of it and help, you know, make, yeah. it, make it fucking be the best it can be. Absolutely. You know? And he's always been good for that. And so, you know, the cave came along. We had some just epic times at the cave. And, um, um, yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, we, and we've, we've all been to, to Rob's a few times. Like, I think, oh, yeah. I, yeah, I met Rob through you guys. And it's, it, that's just one of the funnest places to go. It's, he, this, this man has like this amazing, like, what do you even call it? Like, Aura. It's it's an aura yeah. man shed and I don't know if it's oh, a man oh, shed. Oh, his place. Oh, dude, yeah. No, just... Oh no, he has a great aura <laughs> too. No, he has. <laughs> I thought you were talking about his penis. You know? <laughs> no, like he has this crazy like he built and constructed like this. Basically, it's like a, I don't even know. It's like kind of like a a loft, a den, yes. thing, a den, and it has a downstairs, upstairs, and these uh, they have this weird pool game, right? Uh, yeah, bumper pool. Bumper pool. Yeah, really fun to play. Just it, it's always a good time that when we're over there. Yeah, he's 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 put a lot of time into that place to make it a fun place for people to come hang out. Oh and yeah, jam and karaoke and party and. So is that kind of the, that's kind of the first place everyone was jamming at. Like, well, that, that's where we started rehearsing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, I thought it was it was his old place. Though. Yeah. Well, he used to live on a place called. Uh, so this road is called Eustace Hunt. Oh yeah. So he used to call it useless. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. But yeah, we used to we rehearsed there the first few times, and then um, uh, and then we moved it over to the cave because he he just um, probably a few months after we started rehearsing there, he he rented the place at the cave, and then he started remodeling it. To make it what it was, you know, because that was just a big empty warehouse, and yeah, and we all put in time to make that stage and make it a cool thing. And then he had contractors come in and build an apartment upstairs, so him and Melissa could live there while they were looking for a house. Yeah, and dude, the cave man, it was epic. I mean, every rehearsal was like a show, man. It was just one of those things. It was like NAF was in the early '90s, you know, like where all the musicians would come and hang out and everything, and it was just... Yeah, it was the magic's just, happening, you know? Yeah, exactly. Magic's. It, was, it was like one of, one of the pinnacles of that era, you know? Yeah, when you guys had... I mean, that's, that's, that's got to make sense, too, because your guys' stage show was incredible. I remember being... I was probably my early 20s when I first saw you guys. I didn't even know, like, any of you guys, like, Araya or Dylan yet, but you guys played Louis G's all the time. And right. Like, These guys are shredders. These guys are animals. <laughs> and I just remember I was in, like, uh, I was thinking I was in a band called In All Honesty at the time, and we would, like, you know, we go to Louis G's all the time because Louis was the guy that, like, right. everyone kicked it with. But I remember seeing you guys, and I'm like, these, these guys are crazy good. Like, this is insane. Uh -oh, like, it man. felt like a, a big, like, I think that's the thing, too, is, like, sometimes you'll see a band, a local band, you'll be like, ah, oh, you know, like, they're they're okay. They, they're okay. They kind of put on, but you guys kind of your stage show and your energy was crazy. So I can imagine that Thank that you. kind of like manifested from the cave, like or the where you guys rehearsed at. If it was like a show oh, yeah. at the time, exactly. And you know, like if you practice under those conditions, you you're know gonna, what I mean. Then then it's you're just gonna hit the ground running. You know? Yeah. So oh my God. speaking of which, what were some of your favorite shows, and maybe some of your not so favorite Ooh, shows? You gonna ask this question? Oh. Yeah. What were your your best shows? And your worst shows. Oh, yeah. I, I think our best shows were always at Louis because that was our, our home base. And Chris Peterson, you know, bless him. Great that, guy. That, that he always listens. He, I mean, he, he knows what he's doing back there. He knows his gear, and he knows what he can do with it. And he doesn't overdo it either, you know. He, he just works so hard on... You know, he, he probably took a little extra care with us because he really, you know, we he was yeah. a fan, you know. Yeah, and you guys... You know, and uh, so our, I think our best shows were really there and. A lot of them are recorded too, you know. Uh, yeah, I did see that he has got a bunch of stuff yeah, in, his, in, his, been, in his computer. Yeah, yeah. From, he's been mixing all that stuff, I think. Yeah, there's um, so um, also um, uh, man, why am I drawing a blank here? Um, there's a couple of guys that have um, YouTube channels that we have like stuff plastered all over. So I, I can't really give you exact like URLs or, or websites or anything like that, but. I can definitely send you some footage. We'll find them. Yeah. We'll find them. We'll be like, we will find all the mechanisms. So then what about some of your worst shows? Or not yeah, necessarily worst, worst but like, you know, oh, experience-wise. I, I have a good one. So we played this, like, um, rock cruise thing one time, man. Like, it's and it's like a... Like on a boat? Yeah. Like yeah. a big old cruise ship? Yeah, kind of like a cruise ship, but yeah. like... It was but a it, canoe. But <laughs> it was a canoe. It was a paddle boat. Cruise I mean, ship for local bands. It may as well have been a canoe when you yeah. hear what I tell you. Oh, um, no. It was... 
it was really cool, and there was like three other bands, and you know, it's just a party on the on the Lake Union, basically, and it's oh. a big fucking boat that they converted into like a cool venue, you know. Okay. It was really cool, except okay, so like the the front of the boat, that's the bow, right? In the front of the boat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so like the floor was like it just like it's flat, and then you get up towards the bow and it just increasingly gets more angled as it goes Steve. right so we were literally playing on a oh. fucking hill you're playing on a hill we were playing on a hill hi and, guys and the we're wood's gonna... a hardwood floor so shit's slipping rob's <laughs> drums are the slipping kids are gonna... <laughs> uh, uh, it was crazy man my mic is slipping i had like people walking up trying to grab the mic and it was falling down it was great it's part of the I set wish some, i wish somebody would have filmed it because we were all kind of like pissed off you know a little bit showing it too but we, I mean, we still get in and lay it down, you know, the yeah, best we can. Yeah. Um, but after the show, man, we all had a good laugh at that because yeah. that, that was just f-ing insane, man. And um, we're on a boat, too, so it's like. Yeah, you know, so it's like this. You're like, <laughs> guys, all right, break down. <laughs> <laughs> do, 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 do. Halfway through the song, you're just puking. You got yeah, sick. Like, God. <laughs> and this next song is. Blah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. What are some of the coolest bands that you, got, uh, you guys got to play with? Yeah, open um, for? Gosh, we got to play for so many really, really cool bands. I think I think ones that would stick out for most of your audience right now would be like Devin Townsend, um, Dope, John Five. I um, that. I played that show with you guys. Yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was <laughs> that a fun was, one. That guy's an animal. Yes, Dylan it's also fun. filled in for Renee for uh, quite a while, man, uh, for what, six, eight weeks or something like that while he was in Yeah, something America. like that. Yeah. yeah. No, it was a great time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's where I really got to, like, meet all those guys and Tony and Bobby and stuff too. And yeah, no, that was, right. and, 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 uh, Bobby wasn't playing in the band at the time. It was Eric wherever, but, uh, right. Yeah, uh, no, it, yeah, Bobby was still kind of coming around. Isn't a Bobby bit. like who's with the Live 85? And yes. Like, I love yeah. Bobby. Bobby's He's such a nice guy. Yeah. Which right. I found out that he. Um, I like his uh, uh, Facebook profile name. What is it? Mark, oh. Mark Zuckerberg. Oh, yeah. Balls. Balls. <laughs> yeah. Gargle my nuts. <laughs> like, sometimes I like, gargle slip my nuts. I call him Mark. Or, yeah, no. gargle my balls. <laughs> Dude, he's awesome. <laughs> He's yeah. friends with Leon, which is kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that my uh, my my now husband and my dad they met way before I met my husband, and one You're of now husband You're my now dad. husband before <laughs> I met my now husband. What's that supposed to mean? <laughs> my then husband. I guess different. there's gonna my be a future. Husband. There's gonna be a future. One. His, ha- his hair was longer back then. No, uh, I think uh, so. My dad's well, I first show. So. I think mechanisms first show. Your first show was with Unhaloed, right? Well, our first show um, in Tacoma was with Unhaloed. Our very first show was at the Central in Seattle. Oh, okay. A saloon? Central Saloon? Yeah, Central yeah. Saloon, yeah. Well, didn't they get a remodel? Quick quick note. They got I a, think so. Did they remodel? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Maybe. I, think I, I think I heard something about that, yeah. but maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, yeah no, that, that was a crazy night because we're playing a biker club. Um, yeah. I'm not going to say who exactly. But um, I remember going up to, the, I'm probably like 15, maybe, you know, somewhere yeah. right around there. And I'm bringing my kick drum into the into the place where we're playing, and there's just some old biker lady. She's like, "Isn't it past your bedtime, little boy?" <laughs> oh and my. I'm just like, "Oh my god, oh my god!" And then some biker dude's like, "Hey, bitch, <laughs> get out of here, get in. <laughs> leave him alone." And I was like, "I was I, I'm scared to death. I was like, why are we here right now?" <laughs> Every time I hear the story, there's a new detail. Oh, well, I think that was our. Probably second or third show that we'd played on the same venue. Oh, really? Yeah. I think our first one was at um, O'Malley's. Oh, oh yeah. No, no, Wait, no, as no, O'Malley's, at, but um, O Maggie's. Oh, oh, that Maggie Maggie O'Toole's. O'Toole's. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. Oh, Where's that? Maggie Where was that? Was uh, gosh. Liquid. Yeah, that was Liquid. Liquid. Okay. Oh, wow. I, I've heard of O'Malley's. That's that was Tacoma, such right? a cool place. Yeah. Because they, they would let. That was before they cracked down on like you know letting underage people into bars and stuff. So. You know, we kind of we kind of had to stick in a certain area and stuff like that, but they would let us watch the show and stuff. And it, I remember being twenty years old, and they started. You know, we were so close; we were just a couple months away from being twenty-one, and so we could. Man. You know, we're like finally we can almost be in the bar. Well, they started. Cra- they, they made some new laws where they wouldn't be able to have any minors inside the venue at at all at all unless they're uh, performing. Right, and so you know, like. I what I would do is you know all, all my bandmates are outside and be like I need to come inside like at least like 30 40 minutes ahead of time so I can set up all my stuff you know and I I just take my sweet time and watch <laughs> watch the band before yeah, us you same. know and, but but it was kind of funny cuz they just cone me off you know yeah. like and, and, and then they have tape. a security guy right there with me the whole time That's like the worst feeling too man like being a minor and having to play a show I did that a couple times at like the Ballard Firehouse and a couple other Seattle venues back in the 80s 
Like, okay, you can be on stage, and as soon as you're done playing, outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh man. Oh man. <laughs> like, that's how. That was like that was a struggle. I remember like backstage bar and grill in Tacoma. That was a similar thing. I was like right before I was 21, and we had to like it, Joe Gingerella put that show on. If yeah. I remember him, and we basically had to like sit like outside most of the the show, and then come in just for a brief little performance and mm -hmm. get out. Because yeah. also backstage bar and grill was. Oh, I remember that. Oh, was yeah. a pretty pretty interesting place. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. which which one though? Because I mean, they she moved it from what, one place to another, so it was like there was one. It was on uh, Pacific, I think. Yeah. And then the, on, the other one was on um, Sixth Avenue on West Sixth Avenue. Oh, gotcha. Yep. So another question: What was your biggest show that you guys ever played? Yeah, biggest show. Oh yeah. Um. Well, okay, excluding the Hemp Fests because those are pretty big. You, you yeah. always have at least a couple thousand people watching you. Yeah. I'd probably say, um, so we, with window pane one time, we sold out S Showbox Soto. Wow. Um, and that was, I think, 1,300 capacity. And then pl oh, we opened for Ingve, and that was 1,300 capacity. A anytime we had, like, um, we were opening for a big band, it was always packed. Yeah. So I, I'd probably say the biggest crowd So maybe Spokane, Knitting Factory, 1,500 people, 1,300 people. Somewhere in that's there. a great venue. See, that's, yeah. one, that's one that's on our And list. we sold that out a couple times, and that's it's unusual when, you know, just regional bands can do that. Yeah. Know? Well, I mean, w between you guys and Window Pane, I mean, at the time, I feel like that, oh, those yeah. were probably the ones that could do it. Oh, exactly. Yeah. No, for User. the so Showbox one, yeah, no, like, we, I mean, so it was um, Window Pane, Us, I don't know if it was Jason Kurtzen, but there was like one or two other bands that were responsible for selling out. But between us and Window Pane, we sold the majority of the tickets yeah, for guys. sure. Wow. Yeah. So and that that sold out. So it was pretty cool. That's impressive. It was yeah. really cool watching you guys open up for Ingve. What was that show like? That was amazing. We, it, it was pretty surreal. I mean, I met Ingve back when I lived in Sacramento. Yeah. And he was, I know. You know. <laughs> less less than savory. Let's less just than say savory. That. But, um, uh, yeah, he wanted to let me, he said I could come up on the bus with him, right? And he told his, uh, his guy when he walked away, he's like, let her on the bus, don't let him on the bus. And I was like, okay, cool, man. Right on, I guess, well, we're leaving. <laughs> oh, he tried to, like, get your girl, like, on the yeah. bus? Wow. Araya's mom. <laughs> oh! Araya! <laughs> yeah. Ingve tried to steal your mom, Araya! Yeah, it's pretty funny. Well, he was just wasting. He didn't want me. I was like, dude, what's up? And I had him sign my, because I brought my Ingve um, yeah. tablature book, you know, yeah. trilogy. And he signed it, and he's, I was like, dude, can I come hang out with you? Can we come up and party? And he's like, yeah, man, come up, you know? And uh, he turns around, he tells his guy something, and I was like, all right, and we start walking into the bus, and he's like, not you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's just sitting there like, yes, bring her on the bus. Right. I am the world's fastest guitar player. I am your new god. I am your new god. I am your new god. <laughs> well, so, the thing, so that was 8 billion p BPM? Uh, 8 billion <laughs> BPM. <laughs> We're gonna and roll as it talented to, as uh, he is, he's got to realize that there's people that can play that stuff. Oh, dude, well, I mean... Uh, Back then, I mean, it was hyper impressive because nobody he was the really, guy. He, yeah, was, he was the guy, the guy that dude. Could do that. And, and, now, and it's still yeah. really impressive. But like when yeah. you use every technique that you know in every solo that you play, yep. What's the f fun, man? Yeah. Like I mean, you you don't have to go pedal tone, pedal tone, sweep, 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 shred, shred, pedal tone, pedal tone. Every f solo. I mean, yeah. it's the same f thing, man. So well, there's always a joke too. We had a I had a friend that. Well, I won't say the name, but they had met Ingve, and they exchanged a few words. He basically told my friend that, "Hey, you know, um, <clears throat> he's like, you'll never be as fast as me." And then <laughs> my friend had said, "Well, you'll never have one of these," and it was pointing to a gold record. Oh, so oh he does. He does have some. Does platinum. He have gold he's, got, he's got some platinum records. Is a platinum record now? Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. But like maybe the, it was a platinum. Oh my gosh. But he puts out so much material, and oh, it's so you. like it's it's so overdone that like. It, it can't be getting platinum now, obviously, you know. But back in the day, like Trilogy, I believe probably hit platinum. Okay. Or at least gold. I mean, something. I mean, yeah. he, hit, I mean, he, he is one of the most like instrumental. Like to be an instrumental band and to get as much recognition as they did is tough. I think it's more challenging to be an instrumental band. Like Polyphia has done an incredible job because they're pretty much ninety five percent instrumental right. with yeah. a couple variations of vocals. On the last album, they had some different guests. Yeah, and it's and, and they like. But what's cool is I think they brought up some of the newer generation of kids because I mean half yeah. my students are like I want to learn goat or yeah. whatever right. it's called is it goat or yeah goat a, a, yeah. Well, a, lot like, of, a lot of their guitar playing and stuff it it kind of like mimics a vocal line yeah, yeah. It, it does yeah. it's very it does. hip hopish so they really like the, the the kind of trap beats that go with it sure. so they kind of were able to get in that where a lot of bands of your instrumental like 
it's tough to like get something that a lot of people resonate with because it's going to resonate with guitar players, sure. right? But that's like when it's not as digestible for because you know with people being able to sing along to a song, more people can kind of sing sure. than they could ever fathom what this hum is. hum a fucking solo like that. Or <laughs> but dude, you have guitar <laughs> hooks though. Like a lot yeah. of songs, like even throughout the history of rock or whatever, man. There's certain songs that stick out on the riff itself. AC you know DC. what I mean? Even oh yeah, I'm I mean, struck. AC but DC, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Easiest. <laughs> oh, uh, but you, you can sing every solo though, which is kind of cool. It is. It you is. literally can sing. Every I just solo. love the fusion that they use in their music, like jazz, metal, and then they mix in a little bit of electronic, and then they mix in a little bit of hip hop. You know, and just it's a little a little bit of everything, and that's what I love about it. Oh, it's beautiful, man. They're yeah. they're amazing, amazing musicians, man. Yeah. Like well, I just I'm blown away when I listen to them. It's it's crazy, man. What yeah. is your process for writing a song? Um, well, I mean, there's probably three or four different formulas. Don't I mean, suck. Just, yeah, <laughs> don't suck. No, First that's for, rule. That's for performing. Don't yeah. suck. Yeah. Don't <laughs> suck. When you're, First when you're rule. writing, it's a whole different thing. Yeah. But, but yeah, um, so usually I start with a riff, you know, um, yeah. and, so then, and then from there it grows. But sometimes I, I have a melody in my head and I write a riff around it. Or I hear a cool drum beat and I go, oh, you know, uh, this certain riff that I'm hearing in my head really matches that. Maybe I'll kind of go down that path, yeah, you know. That's so, awesome. Yeah. That, that's a similar way to like how I write is definitely if I hear a melody first and now that I've kind of like been able to figure out how to play all the different instruments, mm -hmm. you can come up with a chord structure behind that and right. then from there it's exactly know, sprinkle in. Yeah, it's nice to be able to, to like have some knowledge of others. Not that I'm a badass drummer or a badass bass player, but being able to play them really helps in the songwriting process. So yeah. I think that's probably why I, I really kind of Practice drums or practice bass, you know, at different times. You, know? you guys don't really need drummers anymore. I mean, you got, you know. <laughs> oh, Dilly, we, we anyways, still so. need our Dilly. <laughs> I'm actually, I don't actually really play live. I'm just kind of acting. I it. feel really superfluous right now. <laughs> so another question is, what is uh, like, what are you doing right now with music? So you know, um, I didn't mention the Renfield syndrome thing, which is you know, back in 2020 during COVID, I. I had to do something. I was going crazy. I wasn't in a band, so I recorded my EP, which is eight songs of just some of it was remnants of what I was writing with Mechanism before we broke up, and then um, and then the other half of it was stuff that I'd written since then. So I needed to get that stuff recorded, you know. So um, I tracked it all out myself over about uh, the course of six or seven months, and then gave everything to Kelly Kelly Gray, which is a producer we worked with, and he's like a multi platinum guy, and he's the one that actually. Turned mechanism on to um, uh, Rick Parashar. And Rick Parashar was uh, the guy that basically did Temple of the Dog and uh, oh my God. Pearl Jam, the first Pearl Jam. And like he was, he was like in the center of the scene as far as producers go during that time. And uh, so Kelly Gray produced um, the mechanism record, the LP, and he was like, playing it for Rick Parashar, and Rick Parashar was like, man, this is, I think, I think these guys really have something, so we got together, and we did some meetings with Rick Parashar, and then he even booked free studio time, like, he, like, took our songs and dissected them, like, he took three songs, man, and, like, re-edited them, like, they're, they're completely different songs, right, and then he's like, and he had me come in, and we tracked some vocals with his ideas and stuff, and he was like, I have a pit bull marketing guy, I'm gonna get you guys a, a fat deal, and we were gonna get signed, like, Mechanism was Almost, uh, yeah. we were almost there, man. And then Rick Parashar died. Oh my God. Yeah, he just <clears throat> suddenly, just like suddenly sudden death, away. he had an embolism in his leg or something like that and just That's fucking horrible. died one day, man. That's really so sucks, sad. too, man. I mean, you guys had a great sound. Like, thank you. Yeah, it was incredible. Even the, the Renfield stuff, uh, Renfield Syndrome stuff I heard was awesome. Thank you. I think the first, I, and I used to come over here and practice and I hear you guys yeah. in the garage. There's so many cool guitar lines in there. Do -do 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 or I don't know, there was one that, but it was like a really fast, like ascending right? <laughs> something like that. Oh, yeah. Entropy. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I love that. Yeah, oh, thank you, man. It's amazing. Appreciate it. So, yeah, we. I, so uh, at, when I got done with that, um, recording that, I released it, and then I was like, I, now I got to put together a band. So, um, you know, threw some ads out, you know, or just put the word out on Facebook or whatever. And I got Joe, and um, then Joe got Ian to play bass, and um, and then Dylan jumped in and became our drummer. And then uh, Renfield Syndrome went for about a year, and then that all dissolved and everything. And I wound up going down to uh, Ocean Shores and everything, and that's where I'm at now. 
That's awesome. Yeah. And now you're putting together a, a new group to like. Yeah. So uh, it's going to be Renfield Syndrome again. Yep. Um, and um, but uh, I'm gonna I'm, I'm moving out of like the super heavy stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. And not that it was ever like stupid heavy. You know, but I'm kind of moving towards like you know my song Rise, right? It's more mm -hmm. kind of like a incubus kind of feel. You know, like nice. it's yeah. rock. It's it's melodic, heavy, but yeah. it's but it's really melodic and very musical. You yeah. know, like it's, it's got something that people are like. It, I, I'm sure too. A lot of people are going to be able to like. Listen to it, like you get a wider audience. Yeah, even that exactly. Would, yeah. That's exactly what I'm going for too. And plus, man, I mean, like screaming and shit, dude. Like it, even if you use proper technique, when you fucking scream the way I scream, man, like it eventually. Like I have lost. I have to keep tuning my guitar lower and lower with every year. You know, oh, I used to be able to sing in standard and hit notes and all. I used to sing along with like Steelheart when I was a kid. You know, like like all these high fucking screeching ah! notes, man, like crazy. Now I can't. I'm like a low tenor like a high baritone low tenor like it and it just keeps getting lower and lower, lower. Bitch, like, you're just gonna be like you're gonna be like uh josh turner like man well, the i think that's Barry the Barry White. Barry White. Barry White. i think that's what happens when your nuts just keep dropping and <laughs> dropping yeah they just keep dropping that's true gravity man I, i'm similar in the in the way of i've i've just started to introduce screaming into like what i'm doing which is kind of kind of weird because i've always come from the singing sure background but i totally get that like there was stuff that I was singing like when I was in my early twenties, and I'm like, "Oh, that's so easy." And now I'm like, "Okay, I gotta really warm up, and we'll hit that note." Right yeah, now. dude, it's good. And I, a lot of singers and a lot of guitar players, man, we all forget to warm up sometimes. Warm and a lot up. of people do, man. And like, especially if it's cold. If I'm not warmed up, man, I will be up there like a goddamn noob, like trying to figure out my own solos, you know. Yep. So, it, but that just comes with age too. Like, like you have to be more. Like attentive to your like self care, you know, like, yoga. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. So it's yeah, it gets harder as you get older. But you know, if you have the fire, it's still fun. So. Yeah. No, absolutely. You just gotta keep going. I mean, that, that's, so when I, when are you expecting to have this this next record out, or is it more like it's in the the pre production phase? Or? Yeah. So I'm I was in the process of recording well pre production for two albums, a heavy one and uh, an acoustic chicken picking one, right? Sweet. So um. At, but I have this shoulder, naggy shoulder injury that's messing with me. Oh. I got appointments booked and everything, but it just makes it really hard to play as much as I want to play. So if I can get in an hour a day, like that's that's like pushing it, man, because I it just starts to hurt so bad, man. So um, I just got to be real careful with uh, what I do and when I do it and how I do it and how long I do it. Yeah, yeah. and that, I mean, and it's good too to kind of find that. That balance of like for your routine to be able to practice like where you're not overdoing it, right? But you still got to fit in that, you know. Yeah. Amount of practice. Time. I mean, I wish I I used to over practice, which is better than under practice in my opinion, because over practice yeah. is a thing. You know, you can burn yourself out and literally do damage to tendons and joints and stuff like that if you over practice. But it, that really only happens if you have an injury. You know, like you can't really hurt yourself unless you have an injury yeah. already. You know. If you're not like you know. Oh, like, if you have, like, some kind of wrist thing, like, it would suck, like, if I had some kind of wrist injury, because I teach, so every sure. day I have to play a certain amount of oh, I, I know, I, I think about skip. that all the time. My buddies are like, hey, let's go skiing. And I'm like, and I love to ski, Fuck, you man. know, but but I'm like, dude, if I break my leg or, you know, or even yeah, just you twist my ankle, buildings, you, know, you got to do some crazy it, it, well, stuff. Well, yeah, uh, being an iron worker, you know, you got to be physical, you got to climb stuff, yeah. It's you know, but at the same time, it's like, just playing music in general, like not being able to do that. Like I get, you know, I mean, you could play in a wheelchair. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah, well, just for one show, just I for mean, like the shock effect. I, like, I, oh, I guess, God. I guess we could just get a beat pad for me or something like that. If I, yeah. my arms. <laughs> no, are no if I ever <laughs> like, I, I don't ever want to be in a wheelchair. I just want to have like a cane so I can release like so a line. Josh cane. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a pun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Come on. I want to really merch drop, by uh, the way, guys, introducing the new cane. Josh cane. <laughs> Josh cane. <laughs> hey. Yeah. You should make it so it's like a beer bong. You sure not pass. It's, it's, like a, it's like a beer bong and a pipe. And then oh. you can have the cocaine. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Go, Josh. Go. Oh, my gosh. That's so amazing. do you have any funny tour uh, tour stories? Yeah, ain't that crazy that's happened on tour? I mean, just well, the, well, there just were these midgets the, this one time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> aside from Actually. the normal debauchery that happens when you're in a rock band, you know, I mean, of course, all the we never really went on tour in mechanism. I mean, we did, we would like, we got flown to Alaska and we played like three shows up in Alaska. I mean, if you want to call that a little mini tour, That's sure, you know, or, yeah, for sure. or we, you know, play maybe three shows in a row: one here, one in um, uh, Eastern Washington, and one in yeah, Spokane. Yeah, kind of do like a whatever. quick little stint, you know? Right. Yeah. Exactly. So like two, two or three day things, you know, but um, 
Not anything that really comes to mind. Um, okay, so before we uh, were to play that show that I told you about at um, the Knitting Factory in Spokane, um, we were there, we are all set up, we get on stage, everything's ready to go, they're ready to start the show. I don't have the power source for my foot pedal. Oh, no. So Wade Wonder, oh. Wade Wonder's like, I'm on it, dude. Goes back and runs from the fucking venue to my hotel room and grabs my shit that I left on the table. Because I was just tuning my guitars on the table and I left my power supply there, man. Oh, no. And we were, like, getting ready to, like, get kicked off the stage, man. And there was a sold-out crowd waiting for, you know, the bands to start. Yeah. And we were, like, the th second or third band, so it's not... It was really awkward. Well, I because can't they, believe one of those bands didn't have. Uh, well, you know. because I had. Well, at the time, man, nobody really had what I had. I mean, oh, it was an okay. HD 500, which I still use. I mean, that's my rig. You know, I've had it for a long time. But um, no, it's a very specific power, you know, power, power source, cable, exactly. Yeah. And you can't really, can't really uh, improvise. You know, if you did, you I could just blow the whole thing out right there, and then I wouldn't have any tone or anything. Yeah. Know, so. so he <laughs> ran his ass over there, and he, dude, it was like seven minutes. It took him. To like run all the way there oh, and run all the way back. He was and booking it though. Hooked it up, man. Boom! Lights went out and I started playing, man. So, oh wow! <laughs> wow! That was quick. It was literally Woo! that fast. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So that was probably like the one of the weirdest kind of like things that happened like on the road. Yeah. No, yeah. no, 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 like weirdos or anything like that. There's always weirdos. Oh, yeah. oh crazy! Tell us the dirties. Yeah. Yeah. Give us the dirt. Any crazy fans? Any oh, like? Yeah, oh yeah, lots Send of crazy me on fans. Your bus. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I don't want to know. Actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ryan, plug your ears for this. <laughs> Earmuffs. Yeah. Yeah. Earmuffs. Yeah, we, I mean, we had some fun, you know. But like I said, uh, we were, you know, we were kind of older, you know. So um, I started Mechanism when I was 35. So. By the time we were like really hitting big and everything, about three, four years into it, I was already pushing 40, you know, a little bit mellow. I mean, I still, you know, like to indulge in, you know, beautiful women and, yeah, you, you know, know but rock and roll and good You know, the like good that. things in life. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, I didn't get too crazy with it. I mean, when I was way younger, yeah, man, I was nuts. <laughs> I was nuts, man. Out of control. Out of control. Yeah. Absolutely wild. Well, we're going to cut to a quick commercial break really quick, and then we're going to come right back with our closing notes, and yeah. Attention. New merch item alert. Go on to joshkmusic.com and get yourself a JK mug. Yeah, fill that up with your favorite brew. Whether that be whiskey, coffee, or Mountain Dew. Or maybe some water. While you're there, don't forget to check out our other merch options, such as t-shirts, hoodies, posters, and so much more. Guys, welcome back to KaneCast. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, all the things. We're back with Ryan Renfield. Um, let's talk really quick about, let's, let's plug your EP. Let's sure. talk about it. So, yeah, uh, eight-song EP. Um, like I said, I recorded that during COVID, and um, I still really haven't gotten any royalty checks. I don't know what the deal is. So Are you through? If you could go buy it, yeah. that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go buy it. Are you through a tune Don't core? buy just one song. You should just buy all of it. Buy everything. Yeah. It's is a buck a song. Come is on. it tune core or district? Who you got? Have run so um, I have it on um, CD Baby. But it's on every okay. so it's, it's on, on every, every platform. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's you can get it on Amazon. It's they on Spotify. They better give you your royalties. We're going to come for them. Yeah, man. I don't know what the deal is, man. Like, I mean, I, it's not like I have a ton of plays, but uh, I didn't really promote it the way I, I could have, you know. But uh, but but still, like, if you get like, I mean, they haven't like Spotify just said that thing where they're like, if you don't get a thousand plays in a certain amount, like in a year, they like won't give you money. But that wasn't implemented even until. This last year, yeah. so that doesn't make up for the fact that it's a like been a couple a years. Like, where's my royalty check? Like, we spent it. Yeah, your tenth on, of a penny is gone, buddy. Sorry. Yeah, we spent <laughs> it on a Jimmy Jones sandwich. Jimmy Jones. Yeah, well, let's we'll check out the Renfield um, EP, which is, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. 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 It's, it's Renfield's it's syndrome. Yep. It, it, uh, yeah. Self titled. Yeah, self titled Renfield's cool. syndrome. There is another Renfield syndrome. Um, they're from like early 2000s or whatever. They're not as cool, though. Yeah, they're not as cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they're actually really good. I'm not going to We're going to plug it right here. Just, yeah. like, you know, have our hands right here, and it'll just pop up on the screen. Check it out. Yeah. Yeah. There we that's go. That's awesome. I like that. Well, so that's so cool. It's been good talking to you. Yeah, this man. Really Thanks cool. for having me, guys. Yeah, appreciate absolutely. It. Yeah. It's awesome to see, like, you know, like, Apple does not fall far from the tree, so this oh, yeah. is really cool to kind of see someone out. Like, two people related to each other be so, like, talented, too, and, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm geeking out. That's no, cool. Well, thanks, man. Well, oh. Music is alive and well. You know? Music is alive that's, and well. Well, I'm among much about. talent right now myself, so oh, thank you very I'm much, man. I appreciate that, <laughs> man. It's well, great. Hey, yeah, cheers. cheers, guys. Everyone cheers. cheers. Guys. Thank you so much. All right, guys. Like I said, like, share, subscribe, all the things. 
Um, follow us on we, uh, the Spotify, Apple Music, or Apple Podcast. Technically, we're we're streaming now on everything. Hopefully, we'll be on everything else here pretty soon. But thank you for tuning into Canecast. Have a good one. Thank you. Woo! Okay.